All right, so my name's Beth Lyon. I uh, work here at the law school. I run the Farm Worker Legal Aid Clinic, and um, I'm very, very honored to be, to be sharing this room and our law school with all of the people who've been here in the audience and who've been speaking today. For me, it's like going to the Oscars, just hearing stories and meeting people who are doing this incredible work. Um, and I'm just very grateful to everyone who's put this together, great work. Um, and so my role is just to introduce the three fantastic people who are speaking with us this afternoon on our final panel and um, to, to share just really their name and sort of where they work now and to let them tell you a little bit more about what they're doing. Um, our goal now is to think a little bit beyond the law. Um, suppose the lawyers are successful and we do our job, does that mean that someone is all set? <laughs> What is someone's life like when they've actually made it to the United States and are living in community here? And I think our speakers um, today are, are going to do a fantastic job sharing more about that with us. So um, we're going to start off um, by hearing from Kathy Tillman. She's going to sort of set the stage for us and tell us a little bit more about what she does. Um, she is a licensed social worker and an approved supervisor in marriage and family therapy. Um, so any of us who, who are, have significant others and are doing our taxes right now, she's waiting outside the door, she has her card, <laughs> she can help us. <laughs> um, and um, and she's, she's done a lot of amazing things in her career, but she's here uh, mainly, I think, today to talk to us about the work that's happening at La Puerta Abierta. And I will let her take it from here. Okay. Good afternoon. Are you all still awake? <laughs> and is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I feel like it's not amplifying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how about this? Nope. Yeah. How, what? <laughs> how about this? Okay. That feels really weird. Okay. I think this one is, <coughs> excuse me, is working. So I'll put you away. You got the one that yeah. doesn't work. <laughs> So we, we agreed that we would keep this, uh, at least I would like to keep it as, a, as an interactive conversation um, because we're going to be talking more about, you know, so what is the work on the ground and what is it that I hope all of you leave here thinking about um, in terms of the day-to-day -day work that we see at La Puerta Abierta in terms of the youth and the families that we work with in the community. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a history of our work. Um, we're a 501c3, we're a small grassroots organization. Our work actually started with a collaboration based in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, I still go down there every year. This is about 20 years now that I've been going down there with a training hub, working with practitioners who are really dedicated to underserved, <coughs> excuse me, and indigenous communities around South America. And about maybe Five to seven years ago, I started to become more involved with immigrant uh, policy work here in the Philadelphia area. I was uh, working with some of the organizations that were really working on policy change and continue to do so. Um, and a number of the families from the community would come to these meetings and talk about and say, thank you so much for trying to change policy, but we struggle every day. We are suffering from a lot of things and there's nobody here to help. And I listened to that at a meeting one day and I thought, what do you mean there's nobody here to help? Anyway, long story short, um, it was pretty obvious and even in my work I wasn't aware that because of documentation status and legal status as well as the language issues and so on, that there was not access to not only quality mental health support but any kind of mental health support. Um, so that's what planted the seed for the work that we started doing in the Philadelphia area. So it was sort of backwards. We started internationally and then we became more localized. Um, and there's a lot more to that story, but I'm not going to take the time for that. But we started out, um, we were given an office at a community center in Kensington uh, by one of my colleagues who happened to be an older nun who knew about what we were doing in Latin America and said, do something here. And I literally sat in this office one day scratching my head saying, okay, well, what do we do? I, fortunately, in my years of work uh, locally, 
I have a lot of relationships in the university systems. We started to actually recruit bilingual interns um, because the mission of our organization is really to improve access to quality mental health care through training, collaboration, and service. So the service part is what we're known for. We provide pro bono mental health support. Of course, in the Latino community, we don't call it that. We don't say this, these are mental health services. We, we give support for the emotional well-being of youth and families that live in our communities. And that looks like a lot of different things. Um, we started to work with, with both interns, but also volunteers, folks that, were, that had the language skills, that had some clinical background, that came on as volunteers in training, because we do very close supervision. We do very close supervision and training with everybody that works with us, because again, the goal is <clears throat> to create the capacity to serve the growing number of folks that really need this support. So in, since 2010, when we started our, our work locally to the present, we've probably served close to 1,000 families and youth. Uh, our budget is, well, one of my board members is here, she knows what our budget is. It's <laughs> tiny, it's <laughs> tiny. We are co-located with a number of community organizations um, that provide us office space. We are embedded in the community, so we better serve those communities. Uh, we are very collaborative. We work with a lot of provider systems, and we work very hard to try to shift the way people understand this work that needs to be done. So we don't just only work with other clinicians. We work with attorneys, with doctors, with psychiatrists, with uh, community workers, with midwives. We work with everybody. We work with schools. We have worked with a growing number of kids coming across the borders probably in the past three or four years. Um, to the point where we have now started groups, including uh, youth groups in the school district, as well as reunification groups for family members who are being reunited with their children or with children in the families, because it's not necessarily parents, it's oftentimes siblings or uncles or aunts or what have you. Um, and we know that that reunification process can really fall apart quickly, and we'll probably talk more about that a little bit in a little bit. So there's a lot of support that we offer. There's a lot of work that we do. We stay incredibly busy. And that's, in a very large nutshell, what La Prata Vierta is all about. So. Hello, I'm Julia Gill. I'm actually um, a Villanova Law alum. So those of you that are here as law students, congratulations, keep plugging. Um, and definitely try to work in a clinic if you can. That is basically how I got started doing immigration is I worked in the farm worker clinic and fell in love with it. I came to law school thinking I was gonna do energy law and focused all of my coursework on energy law and then did the clinic my third year and 180 degree change, right? So I am from Catholic Charities Diocese of Wilmington, which uh, as you can guess is in Wilmington, Delaware. And Wilmington, Delaware does not have an immigration court. So in thinking about, and please, I want this, like Kathy said, to be open. If you guys have questions or comments or whatever, please feel free to stop me at any point. <coughs> but right off the bat, one of the biggest challenges that we were faced with was how do we recruit and train Delaware licensed attorneys to represent the unaccompanied children? There are approximately 300 of them in Delaware, specifically in Sussex County, which is down in Georgetown area all the way to the bottom of Delaware. We need Delaware licensed attorneys to do the SIJS portion of. If we are gonna go forward with an SIJS um, application for a child, a Delaware licensed attorney needs to do that and get the predicate order from the Delaware Family Court prior to moving on to the Immigration Court. And I think that's what, um, excuse me, Patrick, or Justin, excuse me, you were discussing earlier. And so what we did, we, meaning Catholic Charities, is we reached out to Delaware Volunteer Legal Services, Community Legal Aid Society, and kind of all got together. Senator Carper was involved, and because this was such an issue, we needed to pull our resources immediately and kind of jump into action, create a game plan. So we designed a training program and hosted a training in February of this last year, excuse me, and recruited Delaware attorneys. And there are about three immigration attorneys in Delaware. Um, there are a lot of family law attorneys, but 
Chief Justice Stein of the Delaware um, Chancery Court sent out an email blast to all of the big corporate law firms and was like, please, you know, send people, get your, you know, your pro bono hours. And um, we held the training, taught Immigration Law 101, what the basic asylum application is going to look like, what a basic uh, SIJS application is going to look like, how to kind of um, evaluate if there are other potential forms of relief, UTVs, which we're all discussed previously, so I won't really expound upon that right now. And we had family law attorneys also discuss the guardianship application and petition that has to be done in family court to get the predicate order to then go to immigration court. And of course, as you can imagine, people that don't practice immigration law or family law were really overwhelmed. So after we held the training, the attorneys all you know, agreed to take on at least one case. And so since that point, what is kind of how it's worked with Catholic Charities is we go down, we meaning my coworker and I, who just announced her resignation, so I'm now by myself. <laughs> so anybody that's gonna be graduating wants to move to Wilmington, Delaware and is bilingual, give me a call please. Um, go down to Georgetown, Delaware, and we do intakes with the unaccompanied children and their sponsors that they've been placed with. And have a very, very comprehensive intake that you know evaluates all the forms of relief. It's like 15 pages. And then we forward it to Delaware Volunteer Legal Services, who has a whole pool of attorneys, Delaware licensed attorneys, that have agreed to take on a pro bono case. Once that is done, I am then put in contact with that attorney to then coordinate the translations, the interpretations, facilitate the meetings with the clients, and help the attorney through the process with the immigration court um, as needed. Now, I'm sure you can imagine that's very, very time consuming. Um, most of the attorneys that have volunteered their time do not speak Spanish. All of our clients do not speak English. So we have tried to recruit volunteers to help with just doing the translations, just doing the interpreting, because the birth certificate that is needed in some of these applications, or all of them, you need a birth certificate from the child, it will be in Spanish. And who's gonna translate that and then have it certified and then send it? So those are, I guess I was thinking about some of the challenges that we've been faced with. Those are the kind of little challenges that I guess maybe often people don't think about. Um, you know, Spanish speaking, translations, interpretations, facilitating meetings with the child and their sponsor has been very difficult. Um, many of the people that are our clients, they have kind of pay-as-you-go phones. And so the pay-as-you-go phone is, you don't have minutes, the phone doesn't turn on. The attorney's trying to, or I'm trying to contact the client on behalf of the pro bono attorney who's agreed to represent the child, but I can't get in touch with them. Well, their master calendar hearing is tomorrow morning. What do I do? I call, call, call. So this is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation. And um, just two weeks ago, I got a call frantically from a client who said, I've been trying to reach people and then my phone ran out of minutes and I couldn't call, but we have our master calendar hearing tomorrow. And I'm like, does your pro bono attorney know this? And they're like, I don't even know who it is. And I'm like, you have her name, all of that stuff. So it was, it's a very kind of put out the fire situation oftentimes, and it can be stressful. Um, I ended up having to go to the immigration court that day because she had, she had to do a deposition. So kind of flexibility, um, patience, uh, those are challenging at times. Um, what else? Right off the bat, the first thing that happened was doing the first intake. It was a family of five, and they had been in a detention facility, so it was mother and father. So this, this case actually ended up doing an asylum for the whole family. But it was a mother and father and their kids. And the girl, one of the ch children, she was five, had developed a allergic to reaction to the floor and the blanket that they gave them. So she had hives covering her body. She's terrified. And I'm looking at her and her mom is like, oh, you know, it's not contagious. And I'm like, I'm not worried about that. Is she okay? You know? So got them to get to a medical facility so she could get, you know, uh, medicine for it. But then it was, what do you guys have to eat? Where are you sleeping? We don't have anything to eat. Okay. What do you have as far as clothing? This is it. It literally what they were standing in. Flip-flops that were too small, pants that were too small, and a shirt that was torn and dirty. 
So Catholic Charities, fortunately, we have a basic needs program, we have food program, we have counseling program, although we don't have bilingual counselors. So I will be talking to Kathy about how to <laughs> create that because as you know was previously discussed, these families or individuals or children endure obstacles that some of us can't even imagine. Um, holding on top of a train for 12 hours after being raped twice when you're 12 and coming by yourself. And then having to live in a country, you don't know the language, all you have is the clothing, you take your sweatshirt off, and that's what you have to sleep on as a pillow. Um, then, school. Well, we throw you into a school, you don't speak the language. Um, many of the children, I think in Guatemala, it is mandatory education up to the sixth grade. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I think it is only mandatory up to the sixth grade. Even then, the children are often taken out of school prior to that to go work in the fields and help their families. So, yeah, you have a 15-year-old, and she should be in ninth grade, but she has only a three-year-old, a, three, a third-grade education. How do you put her into a program, and how do the teachers help her nourish and grow and get on track with the rest of the students? In Delaware, they created a separate program. It's called the C.W. Car C. Carver School, and it is a kind of sister school to the main high schools in Sussex County, and it's a fantastic program that teaches the kids basic math, English skills, it's intensive ESL classes, math skills, and then civics. And once they finish that, they then can assimilate back into the main high school. So I'm going on and on. There's lots of challenges in <laughs> Delaware. I mean, I think honestly one of the biggest challenges is having bilingual people recruiting Delaware licensed attorneys to help with this. Um, and then maintaining contact with the clients. And my office is in Wilmington, Delaware. So it's a two hour drive to get to Sussex County to see these people. And we've made it a point to go down on Thursdays. It's been my visitation days down there at the Catholic Charities Office down there. And it's been great because we do 15 client intakes. Um, and every case that we've done a client intake for and have sent to Delaware Volunteer Legal Services to place them with a pro bono attorney, has been successfully placed. So that's very positive. Um, what else? Again, the guardianship, I got a call on my way here from a Maryland licensed attorney who got my name from another attorney in Delaware. She has clients, unaccompanied children, that live right across the border in Delaware. So they need Delaware guardianship petitions. She had a Delaware licensed attorney that offered to help, however, she dropped the ball. Two kids aged out, one kid, they didn't have the, um, the consent from the parents. So what then? Do you appeal it? Do you have time to appeal it? The other kids, they aged out because in Maryland, um, it's 21. Delaware, it's 18. You age out at 18. So for a guardianship petition, that's the family court part. I'm not sure, how many people are uh, attorneys in here? So I'm not, okay. And the rest are like law students or? Any law students, or did everybody go home dying for the day? Okay, cool. So I just don't want to use just legal jargon um, and confuse people. So this is kind of where, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I'll let, you yeah, know. Maybe I'll introduce Juan Marcelo. Yes, that's right. <laughs> well, my name is Juan Marcelo. I'm here with Kathy with La Puerta Abierta. Well, I volunteered with them. I met them like two years ago. When I just came, I felt that I had nobody. I just signed to a foster parents who don't speak my language, which is hard for me to go out to meet people. I don't know nobody. But my social worker, they, they, they look for a counselor, and they find a Fort Abierta. And then I just, find, I just feel like a family with them. I just feel that I can join their group and have the opportunities to open my mind. Because as you know, we run from our country for for domestic violence, for all this. So how, how good is to open the mind with La Puerta Abierta? It's the best thing that's to meet people, to go there and speak with them, and feel, feel free to speak. Feel like a family, being with the family. Because sometimes in our country we don't have the family that we love, we would like to have. But with La Puerta Abierta, I just feel a family with them. I just 
we make sure every like every three weeks or month we make sure to hang out and know each other and know about the story of each other. Because sometimes we just feel like we're not the only one who get hurt by the family or by somebody else. But we're not the only one. There are many stories. Some people that they don't want to speak. They are afraid to speak just because of the domestic violence that happened in their family. But when you have somebody to hear you, so appreciate what you're doing, appreciate your hard work, then it's you feel free, you feel like you have people who appreciate what are you doing and what thing you can achieve. That's when I start, I start like become more closer to La Puerta Abierta. As Mr. Justin just said like in his panel, I'm a UR, URRN, which is, I'm with a, I was signed with a foster parent, but then I moved on my own, live by my own in an apartment. I never have paid a bill before. I, have. I don't know how to pay my electricity. <laughs> Nothing. So how, how I can learn if I have no people around me? But thanks for the Puerto Abierta and friends who are from there. They help me, like teaching me how to do things and teaching me how to learn new things right here. That's what I'm doing. I learn from them. And they give me the, the chance to learn. I am one other people to learn now. I want to be an example of everybody that things are hard, but it's not impossible to achieve. Things is so hard to achieve, but when you have a goal, you have to achieve it. That's how I feel free to, to come with La Puerta Abierta and share my story. Because as you know, we are run we, was, we have a journey to take across two countries, three countries like Honduras, two, three countries like Carson. They have violence. They get raped by people, but La Mara, Salvatucha, which is like a gangster from Salvador, Guatemala, all these people, they get hurt. They don't want to speak, they just want to build their house. They just want to be like hiding. They just want to be in the dark and then open their, their mind. But things when you speak, you can you feel comfortable. You feel that people are there waiting for your speech, are waiting for you to motivate them. But sometimes you just feel afraid, just stay home. I used to do that. When I, when I first arrived, my mom should not speak nothing in Spanish, like I said. All I do is just stay in my house watching TV, just all day. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to learn English. But then when I think about how how things how was in my country, how how hard it was it, I just started learning. I started learning English going to school and having a good grades. Even when like I just first came, I don't know any word of English. I just I dropped out of my school in Guatemala when I was like three and four grade. I just drop, drop out. My father, he asked me money to go to drink alcohol. I give him all my money. So I just have to drop out of my school, but then when I come here, I was saying the foster parents who helped me to go to high school to achieve goal, to achieve things, that my father, he didn't believe me I could, I can do it. And now I'm so excited to be here in America and being a good student. Being in an honorable society of the school, having a honorable, it's just I just feel proud of myself. Some chat. <laughs> yeah, well, I just, I'm just happy. I'm happy working with La Puerta Abierta and helping other people who, who, to know that we can do it. We can do it after long, long journal we've taken to other countries. After all things happen and um, the domestic violence, we still can wake up and work hard. Yeah. It's like a walking advertisement, right, for La Puerta Abierta. Um, I was <laughs> thanks, Marcelo. <laughs> but I, I have to say that. Um, 
even the work that we do cannot be done without the partnerships that we have in the community. And um, it's impossible to do it without the relationships that we all have with each other. So, you know, when Marcelo was talking about school, you know, we had to also develop relationships with different school systems, not just in Philadelphia, but in the surrounding counties. Um, because we have to be where the kids and the families are and then understand those communities and figure out where we plug in and where we all also can help them understand the needs of the kids and the families so that they're doing, as first responders as we call them, that they, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a high school principal, whether you are the doctor that the kids are seeing in the clinic or the families are going to the attorneys, that we all have to be on the same page. And that's a lot of the work that we do. So yes, you know, the direct services that we do and working directly with, with the youth and with the families is very important and it's, I'm inspired every day by it. I mean, kids know, I, I love them, they know it. Um, she is our mom. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just me. I want to make that really clear. Yeah, Mama Katita here, it's not just me. Uh, we have so many wonderful people that work with us, and they and everybody, we all support one another, and the kids feel that. And, and especially, as Marcelo said, so many of the kids that we work with don't have family here. Um, they don't have any family members that they can connect to. And it's not just us that they connect to, but they see what loving and, and healthy relationships look like. And that becomes a model for them to think. And not, all, not every child that we work with follows that path. We have worked with many, many kids who have really struggled and have really sort of just you know, struggled along and you know, dropped out of school, no matter how much we keep our foot in their backs and, and or our feet in their backs. Um, but things happen, you know, the girlfriend gets pregnant, they feel like they have to go to work, they're, they're struggling in school, it's too hard, they're not learning English fast enough. This is what we work with every single day. And when, when you had said about patients, it requires such an enormous amount of patience on, ev on the part of everybody because there is no microwave you know, outcome here. You know? And unfortunately in our, especially in the mental health system, you know, so many services are, you know, you're funded for eight weeks or, or even you know, three months as though that's going to give the time to really ground some kind of improvement or, or outcome that is positive. And we know it might take years, that it's about planting seeds and it's about really giving people hope and helping them understand themselves and connecting to other relationships, whether it's youth connecting with other youth, which is something we work on vigorously all the time, but also with families in the community that we work with, whether it's relationships within the family system, because we work with that, because we're very relationally focused, or if it's, it's also families connecting to other families in the community. And I, I want to say two very important points. One is that when we talk about Latin America, and we talk about countries in Latin America and Spanish-speaking folks, you know, we know, and I, I hope all of you know, that there is such an enormous diversity just across the countries in Latin America. So, how we work with folks from Guatemala versus El Salvador versus Ecuador versus Mexico versus, we have to learn this constantly. Fortunately, the folks that work with us have either lived or are from many of these countries, so that's a real advantage that we have. Um, but we are constantly in a learning mode, you know, understanding the very subtle and sometimes not so subtle dynamics within the communities so of, you know, I remember a family we had um, that had been part of the evangelical church system and they moved to another part of Philadelphia and, and joined a Catholic church in that community and they became ostracized by their, their community and were distraught. And I thought, well, you know, they're church going, they're, they're still very grounded in their faith, but no, it was something very personal in that community. And these are the kinds of sort of subtle things that we've had to learn about and certainly not judge, this is what it is, and how do you work with that? Um, so you can imagine, I call it organized messiness. <laughs> you know, that's what it feels like all the time. 
and, and, but we learn so much and we really feel so strongly about sharing what we learn with other people in the community. So we are all doing this work well. And the other point that I want to make, just going back to the school piece, that's the one thing that we can leverage as a program, is the federal right to education. And boy, do we leverage that. Because we are not educators, but we work with school-age kids, and we hold these schools accountable. How many of you are familiar with the federal laws to the right to education? Learn about it. <laughs> because there's so much in there. In fact, we now have an education lawyer on our board which is wonderful because now we have this like direct pathway to anything we need to know. But we work with places like the Education Law Center as an example. When we have a concern that, you know, a young person has come into the community, you know, even things like, you know, admission into school within a certain time period, we had to learn those laws so that we could advocate with the family if the family is present or with whoever it is in the system that's working with that child. Um, when we talk about kids aging out, we have had a number of cases where we are referred a young person who's through some kind of post-release service, let's say, in New York. And, and this is happening, unfortunately, more and more frequently, where it is oftentimes a young girl who just had a baby or is about to have a baby, and so there's um, a period of time that she's out of school. And if there is school dis education disruption in her home country, getting her into school and staying there and then making accommodation for the baby feels like an impossible task, but we have to figure something out quickly because we find out that she's turning 18 in a month. And um, you know, these are the kinds of things where you know, we're clinicians, we're therapists, and we're thinking, and we actually just had a case like that, and you know, she's now three weeks, of, she has a five-month-old baby, three weeks away from her 18th birthday. And I won't go into the whole long story, but she pretty much missed her opportunity to get a petition filed because she just psychologically was going through so much that it was all we could do to just connect with her and engage her. Fortunately, we've been able to do that, but she's pretty much missed the, the SIDGE and I'm not a lawyer, so, you know, but working with some of our colleagues, in, in this case, Hyas, it, it just became impossible. But we're still connected with her, and we're just going to have to figure out another strategy to make sure she's okay. Because now, you know, this is a situation where she's thinking, I'm not in school, I feel so isolated, I'm living in a, in a situation right now that I feel miserable, I have a baby, which is, that's fine with her, and she really misses her family members and her community back in her home country, and now she's starting to talk about going back after everything she went through to get here, you know? So these are the, you know, that's one of probably 200 examples of the kinds of very complicated scenarios that we work with. Um, but that school piece is something that we try to leverage and at least try to get some kind of anchor for the kids and get them situated. Working with kids who have had disrupted education, as, as you had mentioned, the majority of the young people that we work with have had either no education or disrupted education. And they are placed in high school. We work closely with the Newcomer Learning Academy, which sounds similar to what you described in Delaware. Um, but you know, this is Philadelphia School District. And we know they're not in such great shape. And you know, so, so we're working with an under-resourced system with folks who come in with no resources themselves. And how do we make this happen? So we, we have learned to be very inventive, very creative, and as I said before, very patient. So, yes? I have a question for Julia. Um, one of the things we've been hearing about in different parts of the country is um, children who are released from ORR custody to non-parents, um, to distant family members, to an older sibling who has her own set of issues to work with, and real breakdowns in the placement. Again, not necessarily exhibiting any judgment towards that, but for whatever reason, the placement is falling apart. And I'm wondering if, if you see those types of cases with the families that you all 
are working with, is there ever any CPS or whatever the agency is, <laughs> DCFS, CPS, little DHS involvement in those cases and how, how the systems are communicating? Are they communicating? Are there lots of barriers? Yes, so to answer part one of your question, um, there, are, there have been cases where there has been a breakdown. For example, we placed a child with uh, a pro bono attorney and had everything kind of lined up for that. His, oh, can you guys hear me? I know I have a loud voice anyway. Um, too many years of cheerleading. But, <laughs> but what happened was his sponsor, which was his sister, contacted their brother, who lived in California, and came flying in to swoop in and wanted to do everything. And we tried to explain to him, we have a free pro bono lawyer. You don't have to pay anything. And he just didn't trust it at all and said, nope, you're not going to talk to BDL anymore, which is the child, um, you're out, because I'm going to hire a lawyer, and I'm going to pay, and it's going to be better than anybody that's free. That's one issue. Um, we do have DCFS and um, child services involved in some cases. For example, we had a girl that came, was sexually assaulted along her journey, got pregnant, 16. Um, she ended up, we have a residential facility called Byard House as part of Catholic Charities. It is for pregnant, at-risk women who have nobody else. Um, they teach them life skills, uh, how to, you know, raise a baby. Um, they help with English um, language skills if they don't speak English. Um, majority of them are African American, however, there are some Hispanic um, women there. But they get to stay there and then help them transition into the community. Now, with her, um, because she came by herself, we had to get DCFS involved so that they were then you know, taking care of her case. We had some communication issues between Catholic Charities and uh, another pro bono attorney and DCFS, whereas they wanted to do one thing, the attorney wanted to do something else. So those are some, some of the other challenges that we really, I mean, it is difficult, and how do, how do we do that? How do we deal with that? Um, what we try to do is organize and host a meeting among the kind of community leaders, so to speak. So there's a um, Latin American community center down in Georgetown, Delaware, called La Esperanza. And we organized with the executive director of them, with myself and my executive director, along with Senator Carper, um, who was very interested in this and wanted to help and wanted to get the school board involved. So the um, president of the school board, I'm completely drawing a blank on her name right now. And it was a couple of other big you know, people that were involved in it, in the Hispanic unaccompanied children. And we've hosted or held meetings um, several times to kind of discuss where do we stand? What are you guys doing? Are we all on the same team? What are the challenges you're, you're facing? And um, try to come up with a plan so that we're all working together. Um, is it foolproof? No. Um, you know, I, I'm sure as you can imagine. Um, there are some challenges as well with um, other organizations or friends that are like, I will drive you to the immigration court because a lot of these people do not have driver's license. So I will drive you to the immigration court, it'll cost you $500. I'm telling them, you have to be at your master calendar hearing or you will be put in removal proceedings. Be there, please. Like, I will help you figure out a way. So I'm putting the pressure on them in not that quite of aggressive a manner, and then they're having these people that are borderline coyotes, you know, uh, trying to take all of their money and get them to the immigration court. And so my challenge has been to how do I tell them that there's another way to do it, that we have Catholic Charities vans, that we can drive you if necessary. Um, we can facilitate some sort of transportation, but there is, you know, that's an issue, transportation, getting to immigration court in Philadelphia from two hours south of Wilmington, and I'm 45 minutes from here. So you can imagine they have an 8 a.m. master calendar hearing. They need to be there at 5 a.m., or leaving their house at 5 a.m. so that they're on time. Um, that's been an issue. One of the other issues that we've um, recently has been kind of a bigger issue is the sponsors who work at the chicken factories. Um, Purdue has a very, very large chicken factory down in Sussex County. And a lot of our um, undocumented sponsors work at Purdue, and they work 12, 15-hour shifts. What recently has come up is them telling us, I cannot take another day off of work or I will lose my job, and I have five people to support. And I get paid 
$3 a chicken box, and each chicken box has 150 chickens in it, and it's backbreaking labor, and it's all day. So they come home at the end of the day with maybe 15 bucks, and they have to support their entire family, but now their boss is telling them, if you take one more day off to get the child that you were sponsoring to the lawyer or the immigration court or the family court or the meeting with Catholic Charities people, you're gonna get fired. So if anybody has ideas of how to help Friends me of, overcome that. Farm workers. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. we have that. I've been writing letters and that's been helpful to the their supervisors and boss kind of saying, please excuse, you know, this employee. It's you know imperative that he take the child to the court. Um, that's one. I guess that's one of the other big issues is that fear of losing their job. Um, and the other fear is for the guardianship portion um, for SIJS, for example. Um, if it if the sponsor is undocumented. A lot of them have expressed to me fear of going to the immigration court because they're like, well, I don't have papers. How am I going to be the sponsor? How am I going to be the guardian? I'm going to get deported. I don't want to do that. And trying to kind of help them overcome that fear, but, you know, be honest and forthright with them about all of the <coughs> potential negative consequences of it has been, has been difficult. Um, I would say... 90% of the cases that we have, the sponsor is uh, a family member, uh, an older sibling, um, and there is another issue, an 18-year-old sponsoring her 15-year-old sister. How, I mean, she's kind of a child herself. I mean, obviously, a, you know, 18-year-old, if somebody's here is young, I don't mean to offend you, but, you know, I just think, me at 18, I don't know that I would have been responsible enough to raise my 15-year-old sister and go through and understand and have the attorneys make it so that you understand what exactly a guardianship petition means, what exactly SIJS stands for, how that works, and then so that she can then explain it to her family, her parents, in Honduras or Guatemala or whatever, and try to facilitate that conversation as well, because some of the pro bono attorneys, and I guess as you can imagine, I'm kind of like the middle point between everybody. Um, some of the pro bono attorneys don't understand country conditions and don't understand where these people are coming from. So recently I had a client sponsor videotape, or had his brother videotape where they live and where their bathroom is and how far the store is and the fact that they don't have a mailing address. It's not like in the United States, your address is 123 Lancaster Avenue. It's you see the yellow house on the corner where two doors behind it, behind the big maple tree, or not maple tree, but you know, tree down there. Um, I've had some of the pro bono attorneys really be like, I don't understand that they don't have a mailbox. Why can't we Federal Express, you know, the consent? And I'm like, you know, it's not quite like that. So, I mean, yeah, I don't understand. But I mean, why, they don't have a running water. They don't have a toilet. And I'm like, no, you know, this is not, not it's not the same. So that's been, I, that has tried my patience. <laughs> well, I am not good. I think hurt, are you? So the good news is, <laughs> <laughs> and I do want to make sure we have time for another yeah, question yeah. because we only probably have time for one more before we move on to the next session. So right. just to see if there are any other questions out there. Well, can I just add something to that? Um, that's why I think it's so important to have cross-system training because when you get, we, we work with a lot of the pro bono attorneys as well and we get the same kind of like, why is this child not in school and why does she want to drop out and I'm not gonna waste my time and, and so on. And I think that at the end of the day, you know, people are coming into this with a lot of their own experiences and their own knowledge and I think we have a responsibility to get everybody on the same page. And we have worked more and more with the child welfare system because of situations where, where families find themselves in those circumstances. And I think that in general, what we have found is that these systems are, are really unprepared to understand the changing demographics of our communities. That's just the way it is. Um, but what do we do about that? And I think my experience has been that people want to know, they want to understand. I've had DHS workers, DHS is Department of Human Services, not Homeland Security, here in Philadelphia, oh, we're in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, um, you know, who have said, I have this family in my caseload, they speak Spanish, I don't, I don't understand anything that they're going through, I, can you please 
just give some guidance. And we were very happy to do that because that's what then starts to shift things. And I think at the end of the day, people want generally want to do a good job. They want to be helpful, but they don't get the supervision. They don't get the training. They don't get the support. They're not teaching this stuff. At least I'm not going to say in law school because obviously you're having these kinds of events, but certainly not in social work school, not in family therapy programs, not in psychology programs. So as clinicians, we get frustrated because we're bumping up against this all the time. But that gives us that much more motivation and determination to introduce this new information and insight and understanding into these other systems. So I think there's a lot of work to be done, but it can be done. We just have to do it. So I have a, um, this is kind of cutting in now. I have a last question actually for Marcelo, um, because I just saw on your bio sheet that you've been studying graphic arts, is that right? Yeah, so uh, I like, like graphic design, working on the computer is, actually, I love it, working on the computer is one of the things that I can make at home, do at home, and design things that look pretty cool, which is, uh, it's just motivate me, it's just something that if I could do, design life, design future, so which is, inspire me to keep studying, design new things in life. Well, I, I saw that in your bio, and I wanted to, to hear more about that for two reasons. One is because one thing I've often found in terms of just dealing with the trauma that they have experienced is that many of the people I've had the privilege to work with have turned to art, that art is helpful to them. If they need to communicate something and it's hard, my students are meeting young people and trying to interact and communicate for the first time, and they really want to hear the whole story, but they're not sure how to get it you know, get to that difficult point, so they'll offer kids a way to draw. Yeah, that's right. It's sometimes it's, it's so hard to explain your story, or to explain how, how is your life going. The good way, the good way to, to say it is draw and design. And always there will be people who ask, why you draw this? And that's how you get communicate with more people and explain why you draw and the, what is worth the reason. I believe that art, it's the best way to describe like stories, to describe life, and to get communication with people. So for all of the lawyers in the room who might not have that creative side, consider that if you are taking on these cases and you're working with people. Um, and then the other reason I wanted to bring it up was just so that if you decide to hire someone to do graphic work for you, I hope you will call Marcella first. <laughs> we can put you in touch with him. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all so much for your insights and your wisdom. Right now I have um, the, I think, I think that you all may sit down and we're going to move into um, our final discussion, which is what to do next. And so I'm very happy to hand over the mic to my colleague, Michelle Pistone, um, who is a, a clinician here, runs the Cares Clinic, as you've heard, advocate, scholar, writer, entrepreneur, mother, friend, <laughs> just the right person to be helping us think about what we're going to do now that we've learned so much about what needs to be done. How are we going to do it, Michelle? All right. Thanks, Beth. Thanks for ev to everyone for coming. I feel so privileged to be among this group of people. It was to see the energy and the excitement in this room and all the interest by lawyers. It's really tremendous. So as we've been planning this conference, one of the things that we've been talking about is how we, go, we often go to conferences and um, hear a lot about all these things that are happening in the world, in law, and whatever, and we, um, we never really get a chance to think that much about like what can we do? What's like a tangible thing that we can do? So I'm gonna challenge you all. <laughs> I'd like you to take out a piece of paper, just a little piece of paper, you can rip it off of the corner of your, um, you know, your program. If you don't have a pen, I have a pen up here that I can lend to you. And I'd like you to write down at least one thing that you can do to help this community. I'll give you some ideas because all day I've been writing down <laughs> things that we need. And I'll start with lawyers. 
So, we need lawyers in Delaware. <laughs> we need lawyers who are licensed in Pennsylvania. We need lawyers who are licensed in New Jersey. We need lawyers who know immigration. We need lawyers who understand family law. We need interpreters. We need people who can interpret and people who can translate. We need um, transportation. People who can pick up clients and bring them to court. We need people who um, can provide language, I mean um, phone access, right? So if we can buy a phone for a family and give it to them so that they know when their court hearing is. We need um, English as a second language, right? We need training to help people as they're transitioning and, in, and integrating, assimilating into our culture so we can volunteer to to teach someone English, right, to help them as they um, are learning English. We need medical assistance. We need mental health assistance. We need policy changes, right? We need advocacy, so you can help in that way. People need food. They need clothing. They need shoes. They need school supplies. They need art supplies. <laughs> They need sporting equipment, sports equipment, um, counseling. They need counseling on how to pay their bills, right? On life skills. How do I transition to a life in the United States? Um, and so I think that's the list that I came up with. So now I'm going to give you all um, a minute or two to write down on your piece of paper the thing that you can do to help this community. And then um, put your telephone number, your cell phone number on it as well. And we can do one of two things. We can either have you hand them into us and we can text you in a little while, in a few months, to see whether you've done it and to remind you that this is what you had promised. Or alternatively, you can put it into your wallet. And the next time you run out of money or you're cleaning out your wallet, you'll be reminded that you made this promise to yourself and that this is something that you want to do. So take two minutes, write down at least one thing. It could be from the list, it could be something else. But I think that each of us feels so compelled and so moved today that it's important for us to realize that we each can do something to help. I would love to, to help to translate. And if you have some like lawyer who have clients speaking kitchen, for Spanish, maybe in English, well, I believe my English is fine, or it's not bad. I can help with you, Kiche. Um, I plan to use my political voice and my privilege as a voting citizen to call attention to this issue. My name is Morgan Greenwald, and I'm an undergraduate here at Villanova, and I'm the president of our campus chapter of Catholic Relief Services Ambassadors. We plan events on campus um, that are education, advocacy, fundraising, and faith building in solidarity with the poor and vulnerable overseas. Um, and as ambassadors, we recognize that we that our political voice and that political advocacy is one of the greatest tools at our disposal. Um, so whether you've been here for one session or for all day, I hope that you recognize the urgency of this issue. I trust that you recognize the urgency of this issue. And myself and the other ambassadors would like to invite you to um, discuss that urgency, urgency and policy ideas that you may have with your elected officials. Um, we have paper and envelopes and suggested talking points so you can write to your officials. You can leave your letters in a box that's at the registration table and they'll be hand delivered to your, your representatives by the CRS ambassadors in Washington, D.C. Um, so we're passing those out now. Um, thank you all. And yeah. Hi, my name is um, Julie Hutton, and I work at Lutheran Children and Family Service. 
Um, I recruit, train, and certify foster families for fam families that take in our UC and URM kids. Um, I also place the kids coming from shelters uh, in Texas with the families as well as kids that come from refugee camps in Africa and Asia and Latin America with these families. So I just wanted to kind of plug our program. We're always looking for foster families. We have brochures of literature right on the other side of that wall, um, and I can give out my business card if you know anyone that's interested. You don't need to be bilingual. You don't need to have previously had experience in the foster care system. Um, some of the, our process to become a foster parent, you would first go to an orientation, go through 24 hours, so eight sessions that are three hours. Come get my business card. Um, at our office in Rising Sun, and then I am a community resource developer. I come out to your house. We do an extensive background check. Um, we write a profile. We do lots of different things. And then we, try, we match whatever sort of child we think would be, and you, what you think would be best in your home. So please come get my card if you're interested. Thank you. That's great, because that was something I didn't list, right? For foster families. Who else wants to? Yeah. You had your hand up before, didn't you? No, I, I just wanted to give a pitch for um, English uh, language learners, or ESL sometimes. Uh, Marcelo said English as a third language. Um, but we have, out of Villanova, out of campus ministry, we have the opportunity to go to um, Centro San Jose in Upper Darby, also with the help of Centro de Apoyo, we have some representatives here today. Um, and students are able to go out Mondays and Wednesdays, is that right? Uh, to teach English to a variety of immigrants, not just from Latin America, but uh, from Africa and Asia as well at times. So if you're interested in something like that, especially next year, we're gonna be offering some different volunteer opportunities for, vol for Villanova students in Upper Darby, things like also helping children or p families fill out applications to get into school or uh, health insurance for children, uh, things like that. So if you're interested, you could talk to me uh, afterwards or Irene King, who's our Director for Service and Social Justice in Campus Ministry. Thank you. And I just really want to underscore that I don't know how much today we've talked about the, the Obama administration's temporary um, relief programs for kids, the DAPA and DACA that many of you have probably heard about. Well, one of those big programs is predicated on being in some kind of schooling. So if you don't have a high school degree, being in an, an ESL program can actually get you a work authorization and reprieve from deportation. So if you're at all willing to tutor and use that beautiful English language ability that you have, you can do a lot more than just language. You're also potentially helping people get their status for a little while. want to volunteer to talk about what they wrote down on their little piece of paper? Okay. <laughs> so introduce yourself first. Hi, so my name is Sonia and I'm from New York and I work for an organization called the International Network for Public Schools. And maybe it's because I'm in front of the camera. Yep. And, um, Hold on. Come down here. Yeah, I'll come down, sorry. Um, so, one of the things that the organization does is that they are trying to tackle the SIFE issue, which is talking about interrupted education. And I'm going to try to bring a lot of this back to the organization um, and introduce some of this work and see if any of that can also be shared with some of the schools here, but I'm also here, aside from International's Network, definitely plan on joining the Child Advocacy Group in New York, along with my colleague, Diana. Um, and aside from that, we also run a English uh, language learning program for recently arrived Latino immigrant students, and our focus is on college readiness, so we really tackle on 
having that cultural uh, space to talk about some of these narratives. And I really thank you, Marcelo, for sharing your story. We hear a lot of these stories all the time. And, and it's really important to be able to have spaces like that where you can feel safe and feel that you can talk about these things, right? And so I would really love to maybe do something here in PA and, and talk about some of these college readiness or the road to college um, and see how we can collaborate um, with my colleague Diana over there. And the organization is called LIHEP, L-Y-H-E-P, um, Latino Youth for Higher Education Program. So that's what I'm hoping to do. Anyone else? So I mentioned um, that we are, mental health counseling is very important um, for a lot of these people and we do not have a bilingual mental health therapist at Catholic Charities. Um, so I am going to speak with Kathy, if she'll be so kind, um, to take a phone call and perhaps figure out how to recruit and train um, a bilingual person to work in Sussex County um, specifically because I think that will be a tremendous tremendous help and to us and to the families and displaced children, parents, everybody. So that's what I'll do from a Catholic charity standpoint. So I'd like to thank this, this event took a lot of planning and I really want to take some time to thank all the people who are involved in planning it. Um, Elena, <laughs> stand up, please. Christine, stand up, please. Greg. So these guys are all third year law students, and they've spent hundreds, like tons of hours working on this, both working with clients and also working on playing this event. So I just want to recognize them and thank them for all their work. <laughs> in the stamp wave. <laughs> and Sue Toby, stand up. Tim McConnell. And Irene. <laughs> Beth Ryan. Um, who are, and then there's tons of people at the law school, like Joe Mariani. Nicole Garifano and Jennifer Henfey, who all made like the room available and the videotaping. We should thank our video videographer in the back. <laughs> and there are a lot of other people I'm probably forgetting, but um, it really was an ama amazing effort. And I, I'm so excited that we were able to pull it off and that it was so successful. So thank you, all, everyone in the audience as well, for making that. Um, for filling out your sheet. So now the question is, are you going to put it in your wallet or do you want to give it to us and have us prod you every once in a while to make sure that you've kept up with your promise? If you want us to prod you, come and give it to me and I will assign it to one of the students probably to text and prod. <laughs> um, and we have a beautiful reception afterwards. So we'd really want to continue the conversation um, with food and refreshments outside. So please, before you get on the road, stop and, uh, and hang out with us a while in a casual setting. Thanks.